Here we are. Jeff, thanks for being here on, at least in your case, a very, very early hour. <laughs> oh, sure. It's my, my pleasure. And I uh, appreciate your, you talked with me for my article that I just ran. I didn't quote you. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, uh, I, bet I appreciated your insight. You know, so, yeah. I just ran. I didn't quote you. Again with the echo, but now it's fixed. Sorry, my mistake. Yeah, you shaked the world of audiophiles and vinyl lovers with your with your article yet again, and uh, I'm I'm totally happy that that we can talk and discuss a bit about this article and and maybe you give us some some insights. How how was it? What what did you do behind the scenes? But I think it's safe to say that you talk to a lot of people, didn't you? <laughs> well, what I, I mean, I'm not, um, I mean, many of the people that you talk to and, and you and um, many of the sources and the people that are on those, you know, on the Hoffman message board, those people know a lot more than I do. I mean, I love music and I've been um, listening to it since I was a little kid and went into my parents' records and built little forts out of them and stuff and put the beginning of revolution on, on my dad's, uh kls turntable you know in the 70s but I, I i'm no expert and so really what i depend on and what i do is the uh, going out and reporting and finding different voices mm -hmm. and i work hard at that i mean that is a strength it uh, is going and really being aggressive about talking with people so i call anyone so i mean like bernie grunman i just called him like on a sunday night got him on the phone um feels to me like uh that's that's an important piece of this and also you know i don't know if i shook up the audio world or the audiophile world or whatever you want to call it i think that my job was to bring a story to people who are smart but might not know this world and to explain it to them people who had never heard of mobile fidelity mm -hmm. and you know our story uh we don't measure things we measure things by numbers but also by mm -hmm. what we feel we mm -hmm. do but i mean it was pretty exciting to see that our readers are that interested in this universe because that story was like number one on the web it's still number three but all friday really? and saturday was like you know number one on the website which is we're talking about you know january 6 stories and you know school shootings and mm -hmm. abortion and that's we're, we're we're up at the top there so people were obviously drawn to it oh that's that's cool information i didn't i didn't know that wow Wow, so so it shook up a, 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 a little bit, yeah. But but your your overall impression after talking to all these people who are more or less involved in this whole debacle, what 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 is your opinion? Stunned, surprised, not surprised at all? What what what, what is your opinion after talking to all these uh, involved persons? Well, I think I'm surprised at the way this happened. Um, I'm not, I mean, to be surprised that basically a record company didn't tell the truth. <laughs> then, uh, you know, it's uh, from the beginning of recorded sound, um, record companies have, have had wonderful fibs. I found this, I, I just used Do I have it? No, I don't have it. I mean, I was looking at, I've got like an album by Esquivel from the 50s. Maybe it's 1960, I don't know. But I was looking inside and there's all this wonderful packaging about hi-fi and stereo. And I mean, you know, they record companies have been fibbing for uh, since the beginning of time. So I wasn't shocked by that. What I was surprised by is how this process worked when I started asking questions like, oh, how did, mm -hmm. how did Mike Esposito get to your play? So why was this video made it was just interesting to me because you know a lot of people believe in conspiracy theories and you know like who's manipulating who and what's going on here and it's usually not that you know it's usually something simpler and um you know it's just you know in many ways it's like kind of a sad story i, I mean i was on this zoom with interview with uh a couple of the press people and um their marketing officer and then john wood who i had talked to earlier in the year for another story that we're working on. And um, he just like broke down. I mean, he was in tears. He couldn't continue really? talking. And um, that you know, was after, after the video, right? Why? Sorry? 
that was after Mike Esposito's and my video that you talked to to him and he was in tears afterwards. Yeah, I talked to him. Was it um, last week? I think. I mean, like it was okay. when it, you know, I it, it took a while to get Mobile Fidelity to first. Mm -hmm. They were like, "We'll send you a statement." Then I was like, mm, "It's not going to work." Then they were like, "Well, we'll have your our chief marketing officer talk to you." I said, "Well, he's nice, but he's also been at the company for like four months." I said, okay. I want to talk to John Wood. I know that guy picked Mike Esposito up at the airport. They're like, well, mm -hmm. I don't know. But they put him on. Then I wanted to talk to Jim Davis, the, the president. Mm -hmm. They're like, don't do a Q&A on email. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't do email interviews. They're not interviews. They're just statements. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to him. And I pressured on that. And they set that up for the day after this one. So, you know, whatever. That's However this proceeded, all that stuff on the internet that people were doing was already out of the bag. It was just a matter of trying to mobilize these people to do professional, normal interviews, you know? So the, the, for me, the most interesting part now is Davis, the boss of Music Direct. When was the first time you contacted him? What was his reaction? And how was he when you finally uh, uh, spoke to him? Well, so I didn't contact him directly at first, uh, you know, so we have different ways of reaching people. I mean, it's like the easiest way to reach somebody is I ask someone in our research department for someone's home oh. phone number and mm -hmm. then I call them cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I also like I was so just to explain this a little bit, I, I think I mentioned this to you and I've talked to you about this, but we have a very involved sound project that's coming in the fall that I've been working on for a while. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was so intricately involved in following this story. Mm -hmm. As it broke, I, I read the message boards. I talk to people, you know, whatever. It was really, and, and I've been holding off on doing incremental stories, but this seemed like a good story. So no. um, so I, I knew about that. So as part of that, I had interviewed Josh Bazaar, I think is how you pronounce his name, and John Wood earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. And that had been set up by a PR agency that represents them on the outside. So I know, <laughs> and I know those PR guys, they also represent uh Irving Azoff and the Eagles very professional long time so I called them after this I I called them after the, after first Mike Esposito's video and I said god yeah I'm sorry I'm, I, I'll let so you know. that means Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab has a professional PR agency yeah they're not well they do but they're not like um they're not on staff so It's not like they sit in there and like go over stuff with them. So when I called them about the video, Mike Esposito's, mm -hmm. they were unaware of it. It was not their. Okay, that's why I not, asked. Okay. Mm -hmm. They were not. They were not informed. They were not mm -hmm. told about it. My guess, and I, I actually I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is when Mike Esposito says that people are on vacation, I, I'm guessing Sid, their chief marketing officer, also was not aware of it right away. And you mm -hmm. know, like we're old men. I'm 51 years old. It's like. The PR guys, I think they were like, I don't think they understood what was going on there or that it was a big deal. And I said, guys, it's a big deal. First thing I did, though, just to be completely clear, mm -hmm. I wrote to John Wood and Josh Bazaar mm -hmm. at Global Fidelity. I said, guys, um, I'd like to talk with you about this. And they wrote back and they said, like, we'll have comment coming in a in." In, we'll have a statement coming. That'll be our official statement. You know, <laughs> see you on the flip side. So they turned me down. They said right. no. And at that point, they had already set in motion having Mike Esposito come in, but they said no to me. And I said, oh, okay, mm -hmm. sure. But that doesn't mean I stopped pursuing it. Like, so then I, I talked to the PR guys. I said, guys, I'm telling you, this is going to be an important thing. They're going to want to talk professionally. And, and, and then when Mike Esposito's second video aired, the one where the engineers were sitting with mm -hmm. him, it mm -hmm. was crystal clear that like they needed to have a real interview with real questions. And that, and mm -hmm. that's, so, you know, the people who are on the outside who are setting it up, the PR people, they were really helpful to me. I mean, I, I I'm mm -hmm. so glad that they were there to work as a conduit mm -hmm. and to say to mobile fidelity, look, this is not a good story. This is never going to turn out as a positive for you, but I believe you will be better off answering questions in, in a professional setting, you know? And then they became open and then, then, and then you got your minutes or hours or, or how long ever uh, with, with uh, uh, 
Jim Davis from from Music Music Direct, and and he was devastated, desperate, angry. How, no, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it that. I mean, he mm -hmm. was seemed even toned to me. You know, he didn't mm -hmm. want to get into certain things that I asked him about. I mean, I, I ask lots of questions, you know, and sometimes people talk about them and sometimes people don't. I mean, uh, he was, um, uh, it was clear to me that he was not involved in the planning of that um, Mike Esposito. And, you know, some people said to me like, uh, uh, oh, how could he not have gotten there until afterward from the airport? But, you know, the thing is that, um, I think he was in, this becomes a thing where like you have to decide when you're writing a story that's already 2,300 words long for a mainstream publication on a complicated matter, how much material you use. So like, I'll just tell you that Jim Davis was in California already. He yeah. was, uh, they're building a plant, Mobile mm -hmm. Fidelity, and mm -hmm. he was at the plant. And I think mm -hmm. he tried to zip up to uh, Sebastopol and, and get there in time. They made clear to me, now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm telling you what they said. Mm -hmm. Jim Davis did not intend to shut down the interview or participate. He just okay. wanted to be there. That's what he said. Now, mm -hmm. you can take that or leave that as, you mm -hmm. know, the president of a company. Sure. But I know that he was there because later people said that that doesn't sound right. That sounds made up. But I asked Mike Esposito without saying, Mike, there's questions about whether he was. I said, Mike, did you meet Jim Davis? He said, yeah, he came at the end. I, I met him. So, I mean, like, he definitely got there. He just got mm -hmm. there late. Okay. Maybe a little, little bit more specifics about your, your article. Um, Michael Fremer also did a video about your article, and, and he wasn't totally satisfied with the role he played in your article. I, I think that's safe to say. <laughs> totally oh. satisfied. That's a very, very uh, generous read on that, but... Mm. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, how do you react to, to, to this? Uh, uh, I would say I feel badly that Michael Fremer is this upset. Uh, I've been trying. He's a very smart guy. He has a lot of um, experience in this universe that I don't. Um, I had talked to him many times over the years, over the year, for this project I've been working on. I just saw him in New York at the T-Bone Burnett when T-Bone Burnett was playing the... Um, Bob Dylan record, and we we were there together, and we both were like, oh my gosh, they're using an Ortofon $99 cartridge on that $1.8 million record. I, I like Michael Fremer. Um, it, I haven't been able to crack through anything. I mean, I he um, so here's the thing. This, he believes that he was wronged by our article, and I don't know what to do about it, to be perfectly honest. I just... Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like he was wronged. I feel like he was, um, and, and he complained about one very specific thing, which he complained about in his video. He says he should have a correction about the, the idea that I, uh, I reported that he said that um, Esposito was wrong. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a tweet that I, that says that, you know, he put out right away that, that said that he had talked to a source and it told them that there were tapes used in 2018. And I know that, you know, I know that a big thing of Esposito's original video was 2015 was when the, when the clock started on on all that. And so Fremer said, will they take will he take down this clickbait video? You know, whatever. I'm not quoting it exactly. I apologize. But if you go to my story, I, I actually mm -hmm. linked to the tweet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I sent Michael the story at six in the morning. And by 615, we were on text with him asking for correction for that. And um, I went to my editor and I said, he wants a correction for this. I mean, look, all we have is our credibility. And if we do something wrong, we should correct it. It's just what we should do. But my editor was like, and I'm sometimes oversensitive when someone complains and, I, and is upset to want a correction, to be honest, because I don't have a lot of corrections. So it's like, it doesn't mm -hmm. sound like my job will be in jeopardy. But my editor was like, we can't correct something that's not wrong. Um, so he also believes that I inf somehow heightened or or uh, uh, he believes that I falsely represented his uh, dispute with Esposito and did that for drama or something. But I, I don't know what to say to that. It's like he was he was on your thing, too. I mean, he was like he was all yeah, over the place saying Esposito was a fanboy and a mattress salesman. And, you know, it's like I don't I'm not going to say whether he's right or wrong to criticize Esposito, but he was. 
and Esposito and he were uh, at odds. And I don't really, I have not seen any indicate. You can go to it, Michael. Michael says that he, in that video that he made about the post story, Michael Fremer says that he thanked Esposito in a video. You can judge for yourself. I mean, after all that very clear, like, criticism of Esposito, I think that the thank you, if you want to call it that, is very vague. I didn't really feel like it's almost like coded uh, or like, so, you know, you'd have to really, I mean, I, when I look, when I, when I want to make up with somebody, it's just me. And I did, you know, I would like to do this with Fremer. I don't like having people angry at us. I send him a note or I call him and I say, Hey, it's a lot of, yeah, we, all know, we don't know if that has happened. Uh, at least I, I don't, don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but, mm. but I, you know, that's, that's what I, uh, you know, that's what I sort of tried to do with Fremer, you know, so I'm sorry, I hope I haven't talked too much about this, but we do care about our subjects and we're not trying to take people down or like do a hatchet job on people. I thought mm. Michael Fremer, I called him the Dean and I had, a, I, I found, you know, I had a guy in there talking about how important he was in the, in this universe. I, I can't, it wasn't really only a story about Michael Fremer, but it was a story in, that included him, you know? Well, yeah, you know, my, my, my impression is, and there's another, there's one point that I tend to criticize in your article. We'll go, that in, go into that in a minute. This, you might, you mean, I mean, you find due to the complexity and the incredible amount of, of content that has been created around this whole uh, 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 mobile gate, Hoffman Forum, I think, almost 800 pages, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of videos, you find uh, 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 things to determine both, that he criticizes him and that he doesn't, because it's so much, it's so much stuff out there. Uh, um, and also, my point is the end of the article. At the end of your article, you you quote a, a person who says, "See those audio files. They can't hear the difference." In a way, it's not. I'm not quoting exactly, and I think that's not true, because there are several several videos. Also, Michael Fremer, for example, he said the. Uh, uh, um, Simon and Grofunkel one step is terrible. There are several examples from so-called audio files, whatever that is. And they said before all this started, oh, that doesn't sound too hard. Every time when they have the ability to compare it to other very good versions, they, in my opinion, a lot of people said, ah, oh, this one step, no, nah, it's not so cool. Kevin Gray, for example, did the uh, Marvin Gaye. A lot of videos said, no, it's, it's way better than the Mofi One Step. But this is a minor thing, you know, not, that doesn't... Well, let's, let's just get at this quick, quickly. So, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with this. So, ending mm -hmm. with Randy Braun, who says, mm -hmm. oh, you, you audio files, mm -hmm. you know, he mm -hmm. probably said mm -hmm. in that tone, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, here's the problem. The story created a debate about these issues. Mm -hmm. And my job is to reflect that. So I would also say we've got Bernie Grunman in there, a guy who's like, I mean, I think we referenced that he did Tapestry Thriller, and he's saying you can, you know, mm -hmm. that, that there's there's no way around it. Uh, mm -hmm. We're talking about, you know, places like um, Neil Young and Intervention Records that, you know, very clearly label their tapes. Mm -hmm. So look, mm -hmm. I can't apologize for, I'm just reporting on on that stuff. And, and, and maybe... Uh, Audio files feel like they were attacked, but I hope not. I mean, I no, 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 no. Oh, 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 I didn't explain that very well. Of course, this topic belongs into the story. My only complaint, small complaint, yeah. is which impress impression lasts the longest, the last one, and you put it at the end. Well, I thought so. it was a good. I mean, I liked mm -hmm. that guy. I thought he was interesting, and 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 you know, to be perfectly honest, I can't. My, I'm not a professional. Um, professional listener maybe i'd say and like mobile fidelity it's like i brought a couple records here it's like yeah. i've listened to mobile fidelity records like this one i think this one sounds pretty excellent right yeah it uh, does 
But yeah. then, like, the Carol King one sounds kind of r- rotten to me. I mean, I think Fremer pointed that out first um, on his um, on his old blog. It just sounds weird, like the bass is wiggy. I like the Thelonious Monk one they did, um, but I didn't really like the Yes, Fragile. I thought, again, I thought the drumming was funky on there. Mm-hmm. And um, my friend Jeff told me about, he loves Yes. I never liked Yes as a kid because I was like, God, I don't want to hear like 35 minutes. So, but as an adult, I've gone to appreciate them. But my friend Jeff, who loves Yes, he was. we were talking about that a little. You know, I never listened to a Mobile Fidelity record. And I said, I never listened to it and said, boy, I don't like this because it's digital. I would say, boy, I don't like this because of how it's mastered. And mm-hmm. I think the point that I thought was really worth making, and I don't know why this is sensitive, is that um, the reality is things have really changed since I got, you know, when, when MP3 started and I got my iPod and listened to them or when Napster was going, like things have really advanced and you can make mm-hmm. a really good argument that, mm-hmm. you know, digital is, I, I mean, I have a DAC and I listen to Cobuzz and I can put on Cobuzz compared to other services and I can hear a difference. It's mm-hmm. really advanced. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I guess I understand your point and like, why should we insult people who love analog and records? I love analog and records. Um, so, uh, but also like it was capturing, unfortunately, the spirit of what the discussion was to say that that didn't exist or wasn't part of the discussion. And, you know, we read the Hoffman board. It's so funny. Everybody says, I don't read that board, but they all do because they all know what's being said on it. I read the board and sometimes people say nasty things about, you know, have said nasty things about my article. It's just, it's a free country. Uh, I, but, totally, but I totally reality, agree. Now. The reality is I felt like we were reflecting the debate. And, I, you know, when you read a story, you want people who read it from the outside to take away, like, all the issues. And there are a lot mm-hmm. of issues that were going mm-hmm. on in this thing. Does that mm-hmm. make some sense? I mean, look, I, I totally understand if I had changed it to, like, you know, it's not whether digital or analog are, are, um, are, are you know, the issues said Simon Smith comma it's that mobile fidelity lied to us you know maybe that would have had a different tone but i don't know i i liked the way that that ended i felt like it was a discussion point you know okay yeah to- totally we are discussion different opinions here not, not nothing more but i think and and that i really did like it became very clear that that's the main topic in a way is you lied that's the whole problem you lied to your customers over a decade or almost a decade and, and 11 and, and, years pardon 11 years 2000 yeah. first yeah. record they say was done with dsd was in 2011 that tony bennett record so that's 11 years yeah so now i think we we've wrapped it up a little bit <laughs> rachel now we really can put up uh, uh, questions for jeff and and if you have some just keep them coming okay well, so um, that's up to them. I mean, I don't know what to, you know, it's like, do they have to speak to their customers or their, I mean, that's, and I don't know how they do that. I mean, maybe they feel like they did with their statement. Um, I don't, I don't run their company. And like, you know, the big speculation everybody's made is like, how will they do? Will they sell? Will they not sell? I mean, you look, it's funny. There was a friend of mine sent me a, a an eBay auction that was going on last night of like a Pat Garrett, you know, soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Bob Dylan, he was saying, boy, these things used to go for like $60. This thing's up to 80. I mean, I don't know what that's all about. Like, is that just a fluke uh, or freakish thing? Is that people going, oh, they're in trouble. Like these records won't be available. I don't know the answer to that. Or, you know, do people just ignore it? And it, it's hard to tell. I ta- I talked to a whole bunch of people during the reporting of that story who said, I canceled all the Van Halens. I canceled the Cannonball Adderley. But what will happen in the in the long term? And then as that happens, does mobile fidelity feel like it has to act or explain or do whatever? I mean, they're clearly very confident or proud at this point of using DSD. They were explicit in telling me that going forward, everything will involve that digital step. Um, so if they are, but, but you can say if they are so proud, then tell us. Tell well, us. Yeah, I mean, like it's it's going back. It's like you know, like Jamie Howard said. You you know, while there were people, you know, Neil Young is like the best, like such a great example. And uh, 
you know, Neil Young is like Mr. Analog. I mean, who, who could be more analog? But he's also experimented in digital. I mean, I have this this thing that never I don't really use anymore, but not bad, it's cool, yeah. which I bought right when it came out because I was curious. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, he was, uh, uh, you know, very clear about that. But when I get, you know, Young Shakespeare's new record, mm. uh, live album, a recent record, it has a little thing on the back of it, a little tag, and it says DSD, you know? So, I mean, like, yeah. it's just, that you know, why, great, why not man. say that? Is there a potential for a lawsuit? I mean, yeah. I'm so unqualified as an attorney uh, to, <laughs> to, to tell you that. I mean, it's like, any. I guess, I mean, anybody can sue for anything, right? But I, I, don't, know the, I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you that I got by now 11 emails from different lawyers who said or wrote me, I don't know why they did that, but they wrote me that they are planning on doing a lawsuit. 11. I mean, I don't know. What, what do you want from that? Do you want your money back? Do you want... I don't know. I don't have no idea. Back? I mean, I, I don't know what people who are suing Mobile Fidelity want. Uh, you know, do they want them to, die, you know, the company to die? I don't, I don't know, you know? Good yeah, question. Good, good, good. I have no idea. I, I'm, I'm no lawyer too, and so I have no idea how this will work or, or what the purpose and sense of it will be. I yeah. don't see that. I don't see the the sense in it. But you never know. You never know. After talking, taking it. Uh, yes, I do. I mean, <laughs> I mean, let's just pop it open. It's like you know. I mean, and we published. We published in the paper. Uh, by the way, that story, you know, people, you might care because you're analog. Uh, the story comes out in print on Monday, mm -hmm. uh, which okay. is important because I love print. Uh, but, you know, it's like we open up one of these one steps and mm -hmm. we're, sorry, it's always the opposite. So you open up a one step and, you know, uh, you know, I'm no scientist, but when you go from this side to this side and you read the mumbo jumbo that's been in it, it you know, it's... It, they're they're relating scientific developments and you know the steps involved here very very specifically and you know obviously it wasn't transparent because now they're going to be putting a, a new um you know we put we, we showed what those one steps will now say they'll have a, a a reference to the dsd step inside of it so um you know they they were uh clearly uh there was a fear of revealing this because if they were proud of what they were doing sound wise they would have just revealed it i mean right that's so right I mean, yeah but, but you know there has been a fantastic video which also would have been worth mentioning in your article and it's from poetry on plastic and he made it so obvious and clear he also showed emails from customers years ago where they stated no we are using all analog no digital. Is that so Michael? This, is that Michael Johnson? I know him as Michael. Pot I know him as Young Michael. Yeah, Michael. <laughs> He's very good. Difference. Yeah, that was a great. That was an excellent video. I spoke to him. Yeah. He's excellent. I mean, he he knows mm -hmm. a lot about mm -hmm. this. And yeah, I agree. It's like there. I mean, we quoted it in our article because uh, I called the guy and got the copy of the email. There was that guy in 2020 who was like uh, arguing with his friend and said you're wrong. These are all analog. And he wrote to Mobile Fidelity and they sent back, the customer service person sent back a, um, you know, an email saying that it was all, all analog. Right. So it's, uh, it's, it's hard. Michael Johnson. So such a, uh, he's so smart. And you know, what's also yeah. I like about him, but again, not to go back to this, but I just didn't want to turn the whole story into like a Fremer story, but um, he's a customer at Mike Esposito's because he's in Arizona, but he writes for Michael Fremer. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I, 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 I don't think you try to bring these guys together at some point. Okay. So, um, uh, but you know, very, that's a very, very smart video. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I, I think this, this video made it at least to me totally clear that they lied simply plain lying to the customers and not hiding and not misleading lying as a, yeah. as a as a as a policy as a policy they lied to their customers and this is terrible michael tell me uh, i'm curious mm -hmm. because i i think about this too 
what, when you read that there was this digital step, um, did it change? I mean, everybody says like, I mean, the truth is the sound of the records did not change when we learned this fact, it didn't change. But did it somehow tarnish? Did you look at your mobile fidelities differently? Did you think just this can't be as good or what did it do to you psychologically? You know, vinyl is an emotional thing to a lot of us. It's not only the music. It's not only uh, listening to it. It's, it's the whole package. It's an emotional thing. And, and we have our favorites, our companies. We totally like or hate ERC, electro recording companies. Some love them, some hate them. Analog production, nowadays mostly loved. MoFa, I loved, I loved. You know, when they announced the title, I said, yeah, yeah, I can't wait to get those. Hurry up, hurry up, give them to us. This is, in my case, at least for now, gone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to handle MoFi's in reviews, in a video, because I want to be as objective as possible. And I think, at least today, I can't be that ob objective. I can't. I don't know how. Yeah, it's very hard. It's very. What's I my agree problem with you. right now? This may go away. You know, time heals a lot. <laughs> Maybe that changes something. But it's also, you know, they could have, of course, made up for it. When it all came, when shits comes to shove, is that is in the correct English saying? I don't if know. They, Good. I like <laughs> if they if they reacted properly open hey we are so something but they didn't and this makes it even worse to me the way someone they react asked, someone is asking if they should revisit their price i mean i asked i asked uh, them if they would mm -hmm. be lowering the prices and they said no so i don't know maybe they will eventually but there i said are you going to charge less for the, your one steps and they said no so i mean so, the record world is so cuckoo anyway isn't it i mean mm -hmm. it's like if you miss out it's a you know fear of missing out thing. It's like, if you miss out on a record, you, you, you know, that that record's going to be, you know, can be like tens of thousands of dollars, more, tens of hundreds of dollars. I don't even know how to describe it. But if you miss out on a record, that's $125. You immediately see it up on the internet for 500. You're like, ah, you know, um, it's just None of those times are over. Even before this, this crisis, they, nah, they do so many right now. I think there is a certain saturation. But what they lose is, of course, the people who buy two, three, four copies of those for, for speculation purposes. And yeah. I, think, I think that will change a lot. It takes a lot right. of, of pressure to the market. I, I'm not, I mean, I think that, you know, if you really are wondering about your records, you should ask. You know, I mean, that's about it. And if you're suspicious, just don't buy. And if you're, uh, if you want something that you're sure is analog, buy an old record. <laughs> what else? What else is there to say? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, uh, there's something else to say in my opinion, and and you, you already said it. We need categories. We need something like a sparse code on on the on the on the uh, backside of the record where it's totally obvious. That's yeah, I, 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 agree. I totally agree with you. I mean, in the old days, you didn't need that because it was just obvious. You just wanted a good, you know, someone to write information on who was in the recording session mm -hmm. and good mm -hmm. liner notes. But now you yeah. do need some kind of label just telling you what, what you're getting, right? I mean, right. some people do. Some people don't care at all. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. it's like okay. even I, when I got back, in, so I loved records when I was a little kid. And then I got back into them. And the first like year I was into records, I, I didn't know anything. I was buying all sorts of garbage. I'd be like, oh, my gosh, this Thelonious Monk records, this Buddy Holly records, only $14. And I'd get one of those wax time records. And then as I got more discriminating and started to realize what was going on, I would buy a better copy and I'd listen to it, comparing it. And I'd go, oh, my gosh, like, <laughs> this is so bad. Uh how could I fall into this? But many people do. I mean, like, it's really kind of exciting what's happening now with records. Yeah. And um, it's not just like, oh, a few more people are buying records. It's like insane how many people are buying records. And like, I have neighbors who will be like, hey, you have a record player. Can you help us get started? I'm like, oh, well, it's not that expensive to get started. We can get you this 
turntable over at this company and this speaker and doesn't have to take up your whole room and you don't have to have a man cave. You can just get in. <laughs> and, it's, and it's so much fun watching people go and, and, and get records. I sometimes go to records, you know, use record stores with them because they'll go by themselves and they'll buy a bunch of stuff that sounds terrible. And I'll be like, no, no, don't. You don't want to get that Charlie Parker that's electronically reprocessed for stereo. Let's find this one. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a better version of that Rolling Stones record. You know, it's just, it's fun, right? I mean, that's ultimately what, what this yeah. is about. Music yeah. connects us in so many ways. And, you know, whether it's us walking down the street and listening to something on our phones, which is terrible quality, but whatever, or whether it's us going and buying a prized record or finding something that we love. I mean, I showed you when we started. I was at my local record store yesterday and I found they had this behind the counter, uh, you know, and just stopped drooling. But it was like an original pressing. It sounded nice. a little, uh, it looked a little funky. I said, can I borrow that and just listen to it? And then we'll, we'll negotiate. You still have to negotiate, but it sounds really good. Uh, <laughs> but then, you know, like this record right here, I don't know if you saw the movie, um, nobody, uh, Bob Odenkirk, but it ended with, um, it's a great movie, but it ended with a, a version of Let the Good Times Roll by Bunny Siegler. And um, uh, it's right here. Uh, and I found this record for $6 in, in May. Okay. So good. It sounds so good. You can find it. And Michael Schoolnick, I saw your post on Hoffman. Who pitched the MoFi story to you? A PR agency and individual? Nobody. Um, I. So I, as I told you, I was working on this sound project and um, I am like many people i follow things really closely all i can do as a reporter is be in the know as much as i can and i read the hoffman message board and i saw the original video uh i have a dragonfly thank you you're right you're absolutely right it sounds so good it's a little DAC put on your phone i'm sure you've talked about this michael but it, it allows you to listen to high res on your on your on your phone which is not built for high res but i am um, just to go back into it I saw this story and I went for it. I very rarely, I get a lot of pitches. I'll just be, you know, I get, they're just flooding in. It's very rare that a pitch comes in that I do. And sometimes a pitch comes in and I do it, but I don't do it in the way the pitch came in at. I mean, a good <laughs> example, if you look at, I did a story on this guitar a whole bunch of years ago, came in from an auction house and said, the Holy Grail, Wes Paul's guitar. And mm -hmm. it was like breathless in how it was the Holy Grail. And I just wrote to a few guitar people and asked them about the guitar. And they were like, that ain't the Holy Grail. I think Les might have touched it. And I did a very involved story about mm -hmm. this guitar, talking to all sorts of people. That was not the story the PR pitch wanted, but it was a good story. But in this case, I had no, nobody came to me. There was no, no, no tip off. Uh, there was just a, um, I was just following it, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I remember our our uh, uh, conversation we had, and I was surprised. I thought this will go much much faster, but it was also an interesting process to see how much time and engagement in such an article is involved. You know, I've I've never I've never seen a thing like that, and that was quite interesting to to observe. You mean you th thought it would be published faster? Yeah, much faster. I thought, okay, we talk, and and the day after tomorrow, <laughs> we will have the result. I was really. Um, I mean, so the, the problem with it is, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, is mm -hmm. you have to talk to a lot of people. You have to get mm -hmm. your information down. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I had to wait almost four days for Mobile Fidelity to agree to talk with me. You know, I had this problem with. Um, I mean, this has happened with other stories. It's like, ultimately, there's no demand on me this is not you know tmz or something you know mm -hmm. this is not a um publication that wants to get it wrong to be fast and so ultimately like i have to talk to all these people then i have to go back to them and fact check things and ask them you know is this right is this wrong um i have to write the story then it has to go through an editor then it has to go through the copy desk i was waiting for days also for mobile fidelity to provide me with um the updated one step thing. I asked them right from the start. I said, can I have a complete list of every record that you've mm -hmm. done? Mm -hmm. and what the sourcing is mm -hmm. in the end, they couldn't provide that they provided from like, you know, the one steps. And then they, I said, okay, well they just were like, we don't it take it's manually being done. I said, can you get me 
when's the first time you did a DSD, you know, it's even something like revenue. It's like, what's your revenue? You know, all these mm. things are that all these things to get the facts together take time. Mm. Uh, and, and, and that's just how we, we do our business. And, mm. and ultimately the hope is that when we publish the thing, it's, it's factual. Um, you know, so th maybe that's, you know, explains it. Yeah, it, it does. It does. And uh, any reactions so far from MoFi? No, I have not. I, no? I don't. I have not. Uh, no. I mean, it's, fr you know, the story ran on Friday. It's mm -hmm. gotten tons of um, readers. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are like 3,500 comments on there. <sighs> Quite you know, something, huh? <laughs> read, read comments at your own risk, you know. It's just like, are you, uh, are you surprised by the interest this, this article yes, got? I am, I am surprised. Okay. I, I, I thought it would be like an interesting, quirky story, but um, clearly it tapped into something. I mean, people are, are uh, I am surprised, yeah. I mean, I thought it would get readers, and my stories generally, I, you know, when you report something, I feel like our readers re reward you generally. Mm -hmm. They are interested in it. And there are things about basic storytelling that make this story work. You know, characters, tension, drama. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that stuff. But also, I think it comes down to music. It's like people are so um, so, so into it. Um, I, I don't think that there were certain industry insiders not willing to go on the record for this. I, I, so I don't know, Dennis, who you're talking about. But, I mean, I called up... Um, Kevin Gray, Cold, and uh, uh, Bernie Grunman, and Ryan K. Smith. What I would say about people is, and this is true in all stories, nobody wants to be the one person. You know, a lot of people said, I don't want to kick them when they're down. And I said, you're not kicking them when they're down. And I said, look, uh, Bernie, or Ryan, or Kevin, or Joe Harley, or whoever, uh, here's who else I've quoted in this story. You know, um, I don't really deal with for us to use anonymous quotes, we have to go to our managing editor and get permission. And frankly, mm -hmm. I don't think things should be off the record or anonymous unless someone is in a fear of their job or fear of their safety. Mm -hmm. To just slag on somebody or say something negative, it doesn't meet the standard. And, you know, a lot of times someone will say, um, uh, they'll talk to me and then they'll say, but that's off the record after mm -hmm. they've talked the whole time. And I say, look, off the record is an agreement. It's not a um, it's not a, uh, a declaration. You can't just mm -hmm. declare something's off the record. And, you know, usually they understand that. It's just how our, our, our thing works. But I didn't have any I don't think I had any problem getting people to go on the record. I think there were a lot of voices in there. And there are a lot of people I didn't use who I just cut, you know, cut. I mean, Michael, you're a good example. I spoke to you. You were very informed, very smart. I just when you're the guy Shane from Intervention Records, I talked to him like two times, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a question of what's the story and how do you tell it and how do you reach people without doing a 7,000 word story? I mean, the story was already longer than our mm -hmm. typical stories and yeah. you just want to make sure you're choosing your words right. Uh, one, one question that comes to my mind has nothing to do with the article per se, but I'm interested in stuff like that. Washington Post, even here in Germany, a legend as a newspaper. How how is the the ratio the importance between the online and the printed newspaper? Which one is the most important or the more important part nowadays? Or are they on a similar? They're both. I think they're both important. I think that our online paper probably is growing and has been mm -hmm. growing for years. And I think our print publication has probably been shrinking, but mm -hmm. it's still significant. And I mean, every story I do goes in uh, online and in print. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I can't think of an example where that hasn't mm -hmm. happened. This story actually mm -hmm. runs tomorrow, Monday in mm -hmm. print, but mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's an interesting thing because when I got into newspapers, which was in the early nineties, it was all print. Oh, how do you get on the front page? And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, you know, I got conditioned to that. You're, you, know, you feel really excited when you're on the front page. I don't feel that way anymore. I don't uh, know where the story is running. I assume it's on the front of our, 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 style art section mm -hmm. but i'm not sure to be honest but um i do love print i love how it looks mm -hmm. uh, do I have any print? Seals, yeah, of course i just love print and so um uh, you know i'm very conscious of trying to get the right art and getting us in, in a mm -hmm. position to you know get make it look good um, in a way it's the analog version 
analog or whatever. I mean, like, I just, I love, I love seeing a story, a great story written and laid out. Uh, but I also, you know, the fact is with um, online, which is beautiful is, you know, when I'm talking about um, something, you know, here's a tweet or here's a video that's pertinent to the sentence. I can just link it, you know, I can show what, you know, what that thing is. And I find that really helpful. Okay, last round of questions, if it is okay with you, Jeff. If you, sure, still, yeah, have, absolutely. If you yeah. still have some time, because you told me you're on a very tight schedule today. I do. I want to go like to, to, the, um, to the ocean. It's very hot here. Well I don't know if you noticed, like, uh, the world is ending. Uh, it's super hot. I think I'm sweating, but whatever. You know, it's your, it's your questioning, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably. I'm so yeah. tough. Are there, are there any more questions out there, folks, at this early morning hour? If not, yeah. okay. Do you think? Do you think no, I, I mean, you can ask me that a hundred different times. I'm not a business analyst, and I'm not going to speculate on the business of a company. I don't. I don't know the. I don't know why they would quit. I mean, they seem to want to continue putting out records, and I just don't. I don't know anything about finances of how that how how that would would happen. Any response to Michael? Fermer's rebuttal. It's Fremer, for God's sakes. I, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, I, I, um, I'm sad that he's upset. I mean, I wish he was not upset. I wish he was not unhappy with the story. I mean, he, he, um, uh, feels wronged. I don't know why he feels wronged. I mean, I, I don't know why. Um, but I, uh, I wish he. I hope in a few days he isn't upset and we can talk like, um. You know, we did before, right? Yeah, maybe maybe my two cents when it comes to the MoFi, uh, if they will still exist in five to ten years. Of course, nobody can answer that for sure. But but in my opinion, we are talking about a very very heavily damaged brand, and I think it's open. This, That's, this... Hey, you you do this for a living, right? So if they hired you tomorrow, which by God, they're not gonna. But if they hired you tomorrow, what, what would you tell them to do at this point? Make a none so professional video and beg for forgiveness and promise you will be transparent and won't do this bullshit ever again and ask for a second chance. It's easy. It's easy. Yeah. Um, what's your two cents on Jeff's response to Fremer's video? Oh, that's for you. He's asking you that question. You have to, you, this is really meta interviewing. You have to analyze what I just said about Michael okay. Fremer. Live, live. I love, I love YouTube, you know? Imagine that 10 years ago. Wouldn't it? <laughs> Great question. Um, I get why Fremer is disappointed. But, but I think I think Jeff honestly responded, was very open about it. And, and yeah, he explained why he did it. And, and it makes sense. And I, I truly be believe Jeff when he says, I hope that we work this out and, and he will understand that there is no uh, uh, harm, is harm intended. I, I, I think is, is that something you would... I think my, you know, I notice in, uh, uh, I would say that when I, so a couple things. One is, I don't, he really doesn't like comments that are critical online. And I wish he would just not read them, frankly. I mean, like I see stuff on our stories where someone says I'm an idiot and I just like, I don't know, you know, I don't know what to do with that. So I don't do anything with it. But um, the thing is, um, I noticed when I was trying to text him or like email with him or try to, sort of make a little bit of peace, I guess I'd call it. Um, a lot of his frustrations with the entire situation seems to have, seem to have been transferred onto this article. Uh, and a lot of the things that he wants the article to have in it, you know, a detailed blow by blow of like how he knew about Thriller first and how this, you know, it's stuff that I just couldn't put in the article. Um, you know, even like he, he was upset that I didn't link to his videos about mobile fidelity. I think you should go to his 
his um, YouTube channel and look at his videos. I thought they were very informative and helpful. But the reason I didn't link to them is because if you notice the links I do, like when I link to Mike Esposito, I'll say in an awkward and halting video, then I link to the video. Or if I say, you know, 45 RPM guy uh, with the vape, when he was, uh, you know, when he spoke about his questions, then I link to that, right? So it's just like, if, if I could go back in time and like relay and just put a link in to make him not feel like I was out to get him or something, I would have done it. But it's like I didn't because it was like not on point. So um, I just I hope that he can kind of like read the positive and and think about his position in the world and just kind of rise a little bit above it and not feel so attacked because people on the Internet, you know, this they're like uh, it's like a mosquito you know, when they, they, they sense like there's like an, a sweaty arm out there, like this sweaty arm, and they just jitter, bite at it. And that's what I think happens on the internet. If you show your, uh, that you're vulnerable, people attack. And that's, that's, um, and that's if you re react to the attack, they even attack more. When, when people attack me, sometimes people send me emails that are like really aggressive, like mm -hmm. really aggressive. I usually write back and I usually explain why I did something. Mm -hmm. And I'd say 90% of the time that it makes peace because I think the people don't realize that someone is even at the other end of the email. They're like, you know, they just they're shocked. And I just think like it's just why? I mean, like ultimately, like all these guys, Chad Kasem, uh, you know, hot stamper man. Uh, Michael 45, Michael Esposito, Michael Ferrer. Everybody loves the same thing, which is like, you know, finding this record, this Billy Joe Shaver record, right? I mean, I paid a little too much for this sucker. I love Billy Joe Shaver. <laughs> finding this record and then like going to the back of the record and reading this essay Tom T. Hall wrote. Look at, look at Billy Joe. The way you keep up your records, you really should start a YouTube channel. Ever thought about it? I can't. I'm not good on the internet. I can't do that. Uh, I appreciate it. You guys do a good job, and I'll let I'll let I'll leave the 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 YouTubing to. I just write stories, and uh, that's that's what I do. I, will, I, yeah. you know, I can imagine. How would you rate Esposito's interview from a journalist? It was a journalistic work in your eyes. Journalist. So, I asked right away to talk to Mobile Fidelity. They said no. Mm -hmm. um, so, how would I rate Mike Esposito's interview? First of all guy's not a journalist um so that's one thing second of all it's like i don't know how to rate other people like it's fun i feel funny saying like uh this person was good or this person was was terrible or uh it, it just feels funny but what i would say is um sometimes if you go into an interview well first of all let's just deal with the result however he did it mike esposito got the information that nobody else had been able to confirm. And it's so funny how he got it, just walking in there and like, hey, can I interview these guys? So he got it. Okay, let's just be fair about that. That's the YouTube and, way, Jeff. <laughs> the other thing that's weird is like, sometimes people are like, they're criticizing him for like how long it took, like, oh, he asked him about this and then it didn't get to him. So, mm -hmm. so if you recorded a live interview that I did with somebody, and I just use that instead of my article, boy, it would be super boring. Um, mm -hmm. Cause sometimes you ask someone a question and they answer it right away. And then sometimes you ask them a question and they don't answer it or they avoid it. And then you have to keep it in your head and then mm -hmm. circle back to it. And then you get to it. And then you, that's that question, that answer might be the top of your story. It might be the most important piece of information. So, you know, there's something to be said for being like a um, friendly, like Mike Esposito came in there basically saying, look, I like your records. Like, mm -hmm. I'm upset. Mm -hmm. And the reason they granted him that thing is because he came in there in, with that attitude, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes, what is that thing from the South they use? Like better with uh, sh sugar than vinegar? You know, um, you know, sometimes, last thing I'll say about the interviewing process, it's like, I, I notice this all the time. There's actually science on this where the shorter your question, mm -hmm. the longer the answer. Okay. And sometimes like um, not being an expert 
is helpful. Like it's it, it, mm-hmm. actually useful. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes mm-hmm. I watch people mm-hmm. at um like I used to cover symphonies as a reporter, mm-hmm. and I would watch the critics come in, and mm-hmm. they would ask a question of the conductor, and they would be so interested in impressing the conductor that mm-hmm. they would ask this endless question, and then the conductor would say like, "Yeah, maybe." Yeah, and probably. I don't know anything <laughs> about how symphonies are done. So I would feel comfortable sitting next to the conductor and going like, I don't understand on Mahler's ninth, why are the violins here and not there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was another from University of Vienna, I like that question. Do you think it makes sense and that there is a possibility that they are doing an interview with a journalist or is this this story dead now and, and come on? I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what this. I mean, I'm not pursuing another story on them right now, so I don't know what the other story is. But I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the New York Times. Did, I assume most major publications would see our story and be like, "It's done," you know. Um, so, I, were my editors surprised by how big the response was to this article? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, they they wouldn't have me do it if they didn't think it was of value. Um, I think that my direct editor was surprised. He thought it would have readership. I think we were surprised. It was like number one on the website for mm-hmm. a day and a half. It's still like in the top five. And we're talking about like, you know, with like stories on, um, you know, January 6th and abortion. Mm-hmm. And um, But, you know, I'd also say that like, it's such a different story. I did a profile of John Davidson three weeks ago and uh, it came out, I think three weeks ago, I'm sorry. It came out on the Friday of the Roe v. Wade thing in in the Mm. Supreme Court. And that Mm. story was in the top five for like 24 hours. It was like Roe v. Wade, Uvalde, Mm. John Davidson lives in Mexico. I mean, so, I mean, I think our readers, like, sometimes you go to a publication, you're like, boy, I do not want to read about a school shooting right now. Like, I want to read about something. This is interesting. Yeah, let me dig into it, you know? Okay. I hope I answered everybody's questions. I, 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 it I was. I, I, I'm, I'm really happy the way you handled this. It was so informative for me. I hope for the other uh, spectators and and the so-called peanut gallery too. Really loved what you told us. It was very impressive and very entertaining and educational. I really hope I, I I just want to say I don't know I don't really know if anyone was offended on our uh, uh, so the audiophile community I don't know if people on the Hoffman site were like offended by the article like a couple of people have said like you you know having some of the people in there who are saying like oh those golden aired people I mean I hope that those people don't feel like I was um, critical of them because you know um, I love music and 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 uh, I, I think this is a journey we're all on to learn what to buy, what to listen to, how to listen to it. I hope it's a lifelong journey. And I'm, I'm really, I love uh, reading messages and, and, and hearing people's thoughts and, 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 you know, being part of a community. And uh, so I hope people didn't feel offended by some of the, you know, digital analog commenting, but um, you know, I also felt like that's part of the story. Right. And that's, that's correct. And, and you're good, right. Jeff, thank you very, very much. Thank you, and have a great day. I'm going to go to the beach now, all right? (laughs) Yeah, do that. (laughs) See you.